The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the Nutrition Education in Schools webinar. We're just going to wait maybe just one or two minutes minutes to see if um, anybody else um, wants to join. We have a few attendees on the line already. All right, so thank you all for joining us today for the Nutrition Education in Schools webinar. The webinar will focus on how to increase nutrition education throughout the school day. We are going to provide you with several resources and ideas. Then at the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a brief survey. If there are any particular topics that you're interested in learning more about, please indicate so in this survey. And then on your screen, you should have a variety of icons, um, and there's a question section, so please feel free to submit any questions or comments that you might have throughout the webinar there. So we are your webinar hosts today. We'll tell you a little bit about our current roles, and our contact information is on the screen. If you have any questions for us at any time, please do not hesitate to contact us. I am Carolina Arango, a registered dietitian and the nutrition education specialist at the Office of the State Superintendent of Education, referred to as OSSI. In my role, I provide resources and technical assistance to schools and work with community-based organizations um, with the goal of enhancing the quality and the quantity of nutrition education that is provided to students in the district. And I'm Andrea Baloli, a registered dietitian and program specialist for the Fresh Fruits and Vegetables program, which aims to increase elementary age students' consumption and exposure to fruits and vegetables by offering a free fruit or vegetable tasting during the school day. As a required component of the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable program, Nutrition education is key to creating lasting healthy habits in children. So in today's webinar, we will first give you a brief introduction on the importance of nutrition education. We'll talk about the district's health education standards, which contain nutrition standards, and how you can use these so that you can ensure that students are receiving comprehensive nutrition education. We'll provide you with ideas on how you can incorporate nutrition education in a variety of scenarios throughout the school day and talk about how to handle food safety when you're working with food in some of your nutrition education activities. Um, we will then give you some suggestions on how you can take action in your school and get started with the ideas mentioned. And at the end of the webinar, we will have time for questions. So, Again, if you do have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them into the white box on your screen, and we'll make sure to answer all your questions at the end. So nutrition education is a form of health education, and health education, as defined by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, is education that consists of a combination of planned learning experiences that provide the opportunity to acquire information and the skills students need to make quality health decisions. So in terms of nutrition, we could be talking about facilitating a voluntary adoption of food choices or having a student adopt positive food and nutrition-related behaviors. Nutrition education is very important because it helps students maintain a healthy weight by establishing healthy eating habits at an early age, you can help reduce the student's risk of obesity and their likelihood of developing chronic diseases. Nutrition education can also help establish healthy eating behaviors. So you're, by exposing children to unknown foods, you can increase their acceptance of these foods. And because of this, we want to make sure that we are introducing them to healthy foods like grains, fruits, and vegetables with the goal of increasing their acceptance and ultimately their intake of these foods. 
You can incorporate nutrition education to enhance classroom engagement, and we will see, th see this through a variety of examples in this webinar um, that allow you to provide hands-on activities and food tastings, and it just promotes an overall healthier lifestyle, and it can really help the students want to reach this general sense of wellness. So the more that we are exposing our students to these planned learning experiences around nutrition, the better. Here we have also included a statistic from the 2015 Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System, and it's better known as the YRBS. So for those of you that are not familiar with them, this is a survey that's performed through the CDC every other year in states throughout the nation and the district, and it's administered to all high school and middle school students. And the survey monitors six types of health risk behaviors that contribute to the leading causes of death and disability in youth and adults, one of them being unhealthy dietary behaviors. Um, many of your schools may actually be participating in the survey soon because it is taking place this spring. And so we pulled this statistic from the 2015 survey. Um, you can see here that only 12% of high school students reported consuming vegetables at least three times during the previous week. And for those of you that are familiar with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's guidelines, um, you know that the recommendation is that we consume the equivalent of two and a half cups of vegetables per day. This 12% was actually down 15% from the previous YRBS survey from 2012. So this really demonstrates the urgency for us to enhance the nutrition education quantity and quality that we are providing to help youth understand the importance of consuming more of these healthy foods, which are vegetables in this example. And all this to say that nutrition education is important because it can help your students improve their eating habits, therefore making them healthier. At the same time, we are working in the education sector and we want them to learn. And you may have heard this many times, healthier students are better learners. Therefore, helping them be healthier will likely help them learn better and equip them for a brighter future overall. So to assist you with determining the health concepts that your students should be learning and at what age, DC has health education standards. And these health education standards are New, they were revised in 2016 by Aussie in partnership with the State Board of Education. And they were revised so that they could reflect the changing landscape of the district and the latest health trends. The revision included input from a variety of experts, including nutritionists and the educators that actually implement the standards day to day. So very important, we actually reached out to teachers that were implementing the standards and asked them for their input during this development stage. Um, the standards provide a clear, skill-based, and age-appropriate approach to the essential health topics that impact district students. They reflect best practices and evidence-based approaches. They have been aligned to the national health education standards, and they reflect the whole school, whole community, whole child model, which I will go into a little bit more detail later on in the webinar. So using these standards, you can determine the knowledge and skills that your students need to maintain and improve their health and wellness, including um, preventing disease and reducing behaviors that could impact their health negatively. So you can use the link on the slide to go directly to the standards. And here, there's an example of, this is one of the pages that you'll find in the booklet of the standards. Um, and we'll walk you through it just so you can have a general idea of how to use these standards, how to um, go through them. So on the top left, you see the grade band. The standards have been organized by grade bands K through 2, 3 to 5, 6 through 8, and 9 to 12. Pre-K has been removed because our youngest learners um, have early health learning standards, and so health education is addressed to, through these early learning standards. And the goal of the grade bands is to allow for more flexibility in their implementation. So the way these, works, these work is that if a student is in grade 5, they should have mastered all the concepts in the entire 3 to 5 grade band before they actually move on through to grade 6. On the top right, you can see the health education standard category. And in this example, this is category one, which is mental and emotional health. 
And in the document, each category is identified by a different color. Moving down the page, you can see what each of the standards would look like, what each page would look like. So you can follow along with me through the arrows that you see here on the screen. You have the category at the top, followed by the eight strands. So each strand that's there actually corresponds to one of the eight national health education standards. And then the DC standards are listed under the strands to which they have been aligned to. On the bottom left, you have an example of one of the standards, and you can see how they've been numbered. So the first numbers, which in this case are a letter and a number, K through 2, um, are the grade band. Then the next numbers are the category, then the strand, and then the number of the standard. So nutrition is category 5, and it consists of the same eight strands. You can see them, um, what they actually are in the slide, and it's divided into the same four grade bands that were mentioned. As noted, again, it is very important to keep in mind that these standards build upon each other. So if a student did not grasp the concepts in the three to five standards, they may have a difficult time when moving on to those in the six to eight grade band. And we really want you to encourage, I mean, we really want to encourage you to use this document, refer to these standards as you develop a lot of these activities that we'll be going through for your students so that you can ensure that they are receiving a comprehensive education on nutrition and that they are um, receiving that education on all the various topics that they should be. So now that we've gone through the resources available for you to build your nutrition education lessons, um, we're going to go into how to incorporate nutrition education throughout the school day, beginning with breakfast and ending with any after-school activities. Um, pairing nutrition education with the most important meal of the day is a great way to start the day on the right foot. Uh, the ways in which to incorporate nutrition in, into breakfast are limitless, but we've put together several ideas to help you get started. If you haven't already heard of the Chef's Move to Schools initiative, it's a nationwide partnership aiming to give professional chefs and schools the unique opportunity to work together to teach kids about food in a fun, appealing way. The initiative seeks to utilize the creativity and culinary experience of chefs to help schools endure that America's youngest generation grows up healthy. There is the option to have the chef work in the classroom, the cafeteria, or elsewhere to conduct culinary trainings or demos. Um, in D.C., there are 12 chefs that are currently signed up with this program. Um, all you have to do in order to join is to go to the website, which is linked to this slide, and get your school registered. Um, the photo at the bottom right of the screen is a D.C. school where um, I think it was Jose Andre came out to teach kids how to make healthy guacamole. Um, the kids loved the chef hats and had a really great time. Um, you could also consider bringing in a registered dietitian or nutritionist to talk about healthy eating or to conduct cooking demos as well. Um, and then in the cafeteria or classrooms, you could post reimbursable meal posters. These are a great, great way to show students how to build a healthy plate. Um, and they also ensure that you get your money because they're receiving a reimbursable meal. And as always, please encourage your students to taste every item on their tray. Um, we want them to try everything to see if they like it and to increase their exposure. And then YRBS data found that one in six high schoolers reported that they were hungry, but only 25% were eating breakfast at school regularly. So encouraging them to eat breakfast and to try everything will help to reduce that percentage of students that come to school hungry. And then if you'll note the Food Safety First icon next to the first bullet on the slide, this icon will appear throughout the entire presentation to indicate any instances in which food safety should be taken into consideration. I'll go more into depth on the topic of food safety after we conclude our discussion on nutrition education. If you choose to incorporate nutrition education into your morning announcements, um, this is one of the greatest ways to reach the entire student population at one time. Uh, these nutrition education lessons would typically last around three to five minutes in length, making them a quick, easy, and all-encompassing way to reach all of your students. Um, if your school hosts morning announcements as an assembly setting, uh, consider having the principal or another individual read a quote about healthy living or outline some of the smart snacks and schools regulations and how they aim to create healthy snacking and fundraising. 
Uh, if you utilize a loudspeaker for announcements, I recommend that you highlight some of the fruits or vegetables on the school menu that day. You could also pick and describe a fruit or vegetable of the week and list fun facts, nutrition, education, recipes, um, any ideas you may have. Uh, with a little bit of creativity, nutrition education can be incorporated into almost any subject in school. Uh, nutrition education lessons should be tailored to the age or grade being taught. The health education standards mentioned previously should be referenced throughout um, the process of creating your lesson plans to ensure that the lesson meets the standards for each grade. If you choose to incorporate nutrition education into art class, consider having them draw a picture of what a healthy plate looks like. You can see that on the photo on the screen that they followed the My Plate guidelines and made half their plate fruits and vegetables. Um, if you want to incorporate nutrition ed education into English or language arts, um, a great way to do this is during Growing Healthy Schools Month um, with the Art and Essay Contest. Uh, students could write a short essay about their favorite fruit or vegetable, write a poem about what health means to them, nutrition-focused readings at story time, or even using adjectives to, adjectives to describe foods. Um, just be creative with it and have fun. Um, gym class is a great way to incorporate you know, healthy eating with being active. Um, math class, science class. In science, you could talk about the parts of a plant and how a carrot is a root, and the celery that you eat is, a, is the stem of the plant, and spinach are leaves. Uh, you could also talk about how a seed grows into a plant and then becomes the fruit or vegetable that you're eating. Um, in social studies, include indigenous foods, especially fruits and vegetables, and any traditional recipes when studying different cultures or geographic areas. Um, as you can see, as long as you're creative, you can pretty much find a way to incorporate nutrition education into any subject. And then if you're interested in learning how to incorporate any nutrition education into a variety of subjects, uh, please be on the lookout for an upcoming webinar that will provide you with more detail on how this can be done. All right, so on to lunch. Uh, we previously mentioned incorporating nutrition education into breakfast, but lunch is also a great opportunity. Oftentimes, your students have a longer lunch period um, compared to breakfast. Uh, which will leave you some more time for a nutrition education activity. Uh, some ideas include, once again, using those reimbursable meal posters to show children how to build a healthy plate, um, hosting any cooking or um, food prep demonstrations. Uh, you could also host a food tasting uh, where you highlight a particular fruit or vegetable and have students sample the item during lunch or breakfast. Um, this would give you the opportunity to let your students try some of the more exotic fruits or vegetables. Uh, since they would be more difficult to incorporate into an entire meal, this would allow them the opportunity to taste it and uh, for you to serve it to everybody. Outside the classroom, there are also great ways to incorporate nutrition education. So there is evidence that school gardens may increase students' nutrition knowledge, so working in the school garden is a great opportunity. If your school does not have a school garden, you may be able to get access to a community garden or even growing a few herbs in your classroom is a good start. So here we have a link to a planting calendar that was created by our school garden specialist. Um, here you can see which fruits and vegetables should be planted at what time of the year with your students and you can teach them while you're planting these vegetables and fruits. Um, the influence of the seasons and how they affect the various fruits and vegetables. You can also find a list of school-based curricula and we recommend using the CDC's Health Education Curriculum Analysis Tool, um, better known as the HECAT, to review any curriculum that you plan on using to ensure it is comprehensive. So the HECAT can help you identify if there are additional areas that you might need to focus on outside of the class of the curriculum to ensure that your students receive a complete education on that topic. And this is a process that Aussie has actually been heading, that of reviewing some nutrition curricula. And so I will be touching up on that a little bit later on this webinar. Books are also a great way to create enthusiasm for learning about and tasting new foods while teaching literacy at the same time. Aussie has created two book lists which are are great resources to help you choose appropriate books. Um, the two books are listed here and we have the link so you can visit them. The first is the Healthy Schools book list. 
This book list contains over 400 books um, with positive food, nutrition, and physical activity messages. It focuses on books for those students in grades K through 5. The second is the Health and Physical Education book list. And this book list contains books that are appropriate for students in grades K through 12. And the books cover topics that extend to sexual health, alcohol, tobacco, and other drug, drugs, and of course, nutrition. So each book in this book list has been aligned to the DC Health Education Standards, the Common Core Standards, the Next Generation Science Standards. And so this way, when you assign a book to a student, you can easily determine which standards it's helping you cover. And both books, again, can be found on the link, so we really encourage you to take a look at these. As Andrea previously mentioned, you can bring in a dietitian or you can bring in other speakers during an assembly to talk about the importance of nutrition, or you can use the time to show a documentary, and this will probably create some curiosity in your students. And last but not least, field trips are another opportunity to provide nutrition education outside of the classroom. So farm field trips provide an invaluable experience by taking children to the site where it all begins. Aussie actually has a farm field trip grant, and this is a way that if your school needs some funds, you can um, possibly apply and get some funds for the experience. Museums can be appropriate as well. We do live in the nation's capital where we have access to a variety of museums, and many of which are free. So definitely keep an eye out for any local or rotating exhibits that you can use to tie in with food and nutrition. Um, sometimes these can be science or history museums. So we encourage you to do that. And then after school programs are also a, an additional opportunity. And remember that any after school meal or snack that you are serving must offer an educational or enrichment component in order for it to qualify for reimbursement with USDA. But keeping this in mind, cooking classes are fun and they can help students develop cooking skills that can prevent them from continuously eating out later on. Um, as we mentioned, make sure you encourage the students to taste every food item during any activity that incorporates food tasting, um, as long as, of course, there are no existing medical conditions that might be against it. Um, and remember, the more exposures that they have to food, the more likely they are to accept it. You can have interactive games to get the students engaged. This can be anything from having a relay race where they're racing towards a fruit or vegetable and also increasing their physical activity for that day. Or just something simple where they're solving a crossword puzzle together and the crossword puzzle has nutrition clues. Um, you may also want to host a health fair as a way to get the community, parents, and other school staff engaged with the students. And then starting an after school club. And there are many ideas for what this after school club can be. But this is a great way that you can have the students gain nutrition knowledge while they're also developing additional skills. So an example would be to start a club that is dedicated to healthy eating and nutrition promotion. In this type of club, not only the students that are in the club um, will be engaged, but then they'll also be promoting a healthier lifestyle among their peers. If you start a journalism club, you can assign them um, a variety of articles about physical activity, nutrition, and other health topics. And then not only are the students that are writing the articles going to develop their writing skills, but then their articles are going to reach others in the school. So you're reaching a wider audience. And then if you have a book club, um, you can have students read a book, and then they can get together and discuss the book. And you can certainly use the book list that we just mentioned to find some ideas as to which books would be appropriate. Here we have other opportunities throughout the school year where you can offer a variety of activities to get the school and the students engaged. Some of these activities are offered through Aussie. Others are national initiatives. Um, if any of these sound interesting, please click on the link. There will be a lot more information on their website. So Growing Healthy Schools Month, it takes place every year in October. It actually started out at Growing Healthy Schools Week, but has then expanded to a whole month to allow for a larger opportunity to promote healthy activities. During this month, schools are encouraged to take part in activities such as gardening, meeting with a farmer, hosting a nutrition event, 
reading a book from the Healthy Schools Act or health and physical education book lists, hosting a chef, and many more activities. Registration is usually open around October, so be sure next to be on the lookout next school year if you're interested in registering for any of the activities. National School Lunch Week is a week-long celebration of the National School Lunch Program, and it's been around since 1962. Um, during this week, schools can perform a variety of activities, including decorating the cafeteria with nutrition posters, inviting special guests to attend breakfast, serving new items on the lunch line, or promote, promoting a variety of other nutrition activities, games, and contests. National School Breakfast Week is celebrated in D.C. through the Hear the Crunch activity. And this is a very simple but very exciting activity. All students are invited to take a synchronized bite into an apple. So basically this means that all students in all schools would be taking a bite into a crunchy apple at one time. And then there's a social media campaign um, through pictures, tweets, hashtags to highlight the importance of school breakfast. National Nutrition Month takes place in March. Um, it was started by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the nation's association for dietitians, to promote nutrition education and nutrition information. And the campaign focuses on the importance of making informed food choices and developing healthy habits. Um, the link on this slide, you can find a variety of resources, and you can use these resources during this month or really at any time. You can find um, ideas on how to get involved in the month, handouts and tip sheets for families or the community, and many, many games. Similar to Growing Healthy Schools Month, Every Kid Health Healthy Week um, invites schools to host an event that promotes healthy eating, nutrition education, physical activity, and physical education. And it really puts a spotlight on the efforts that schools and their partners are doing to improve the health and wellness of their students. And then last but not least, we have Strawberries and Salad Greens Day. And this event is a celebration of supporting local foods. On this day, DC schools provide their students with locally grown strawberries and salad greens. And you can register for the event through Aussie. A volunteer is also sent to the school to provide nutrition education and make that really important connection between nutrition, health, and the strawberries and salad greens that the students are eating at the time. All right, so now we're going to segue into a new topic. Um, throughout the presentation so far, you've probably been noticing that food safety first icon popping up frequently next to specific activities and events. We did this to highlight the importance of food safety within schools. Um, in addition to educating the children about eating healthy, it's also important to teach them about the importance of utilizing safe food handling practices. So why is food safety important in schools? Well, children are, are considered a high-risk population for foodborne illness. This is because their immune systems are not as strong as ours, and a foodborne illness can lead to school absences, trips to the nurse's office, hospitalizations, and even death. Many school-related foodborne illnesses can also lead to lawsuits against the school and the school district. Um, if students are getting sick, teachers are more likely to get sick as well, and that can also cost schools valuable time and money. So it's important to remember that foodborne illness is preventable with easy-to-implement food safety practices. So the number one way to prevent um, foodborne illness is through hand washing. Um, and it's important to be a role model for food safety. We want you and your teachers and staff to wash your hands before you feed students, before you eat meals, and especially before you leave the restroom. Um, we also want you and your staff to wash hands after you've dealt with, with a sick child or treated a child's wounds, um, prepared foods, or touched any raw foods, especially meats, um, if you've handled garbage, if you've coughed, sneezed, or blown your nose or really whenever you feel that you need to wash your hands after an activity. Um, by washing hands, we can reduce the number of times students and staff get sick, and thereby improving their attendance, which leads to better test scores and performance, which is what we want. Um, the second way that most foodborne illness can be transmitted is through cross-contamination. Please. Uh, please stress to your teachers and staff the importance of preventing cross-contamination because this can also lead to a lot of allergy attacks as well. Um, 
all raw meat, poultry, and egg products should be kept separate from produce and cooked foods. And be sure that anybody handling foods are washing hands or changing their gloves between tasks. If students are handling foods, also be sure to make sure they do this as well. Um, try incorporating elements of food safety into the nutrition education lessons. So if you're doing a cooking demo with your students, um, be sure to include instruction on when during that process of cooking the food they should wash their hands. Um, yeah. Um, so food allergies are the most common cause of anaphylaxis. Uh, anaphylaxis is the term for a serious, life-threatening allergic reaction, uh, and it has rapid onset and may even cause death. It is characterized by symptoms that affect multiple organ systems, of which changes in cardiovascular and respiratory systems, such as a drop in blood pressure and upper airway obstruction, reducing the ability to breathe, are the most severe. Um, but not all food allergic reactions result in anaphylaxis. Um, but food allergies are the leading cause of anaphylaxis outside of the hospital setting. Um, this makes it important to be aware of the eight most common food allergens, which are milk, tree nuts, peanuts, fish, shellfish, soy, and eggs. Keep this in mind when dealing with meals, snacks, and food brought in from outside the school. Oh, and I forgot to mention wheat in that group as well. But not everyone is aware of the symptoms of food allergic reactions, and a delay in responding to these symptoms can be life-threatening. Uh, education and training for your teachers and staff is encouraged to increase the awareness of food allergies, uh, especially with parents and other members of the community as well. Um, so I found this interesting. An article in the Journal of Pediatrics uh, found that foods used in school projects or celebrations are the primary cause of allergic reactions in schools. About 79% of the reactions occurred in the classroom, and only 12% of the reactions occurred in the lunchroom. Um, so teachers would be especially important to make aware of these foodborne um, food allergic reactions. Uh, so this slide outlines what the school's responsibilities are and what the students' responsibilities are pertaining to food allergies. Um, it is first and foremost the school's job to create a safe environment for students with allergies. Um, this involves implementing prevention and avoidance strategies and being prepared to handle an allergic reaction. Um, and this also needs to address bullying. We don't want any children with food allergies to feel bullied or segregated from the rest of the group, so teachers should address this immediately and try to prevent it from happening in the first place. Um, schools are also required to maintain an up-to-date undesignated epinephrine auto-injector plan. Um, for more information on this, please visit the hyperlink at the bottom of the page, which will direct you to Aussie's website on the issue. Um, it is the student's responsibility to avoid foods he or she may be allergic to. In certain cases with younger students, it, this would apply to the parents as well. Students should be made aware that they need to notify an adult immediately if something is eaten that may contain an allergen. Um, for students with allergies, a dietary accommodation form may be submitted by the parents. Um, the form hyperlink to this slide is the one used by DCPS. Um, charter schools may have their own form for the allergies, so you should check with each school individually. Um, there's also a special form for milk substitutions, which is available upon request only, and then there are forms for religious or philosophical needs requests. <laughs> and so now that you have some ideas of what you can do and you know about the food safety um, precautions that you should be taking behind it, you might be wondering how you can actually get started or when you can actually get started. And so a really simple way to get started is by sitting down and eating with your students as, on as many opportunities as you can get. Um, and this is important because you're connecting with them. So during this time, you can encourage them to taste the items on the plate, focus on healthy foods like fruits and vegetables, and remind them of some of the benefits of eating these foods. You can partner with a community-based organization if you want some help, extra help in the school. And in the D.C. area, there are many community-based organizations that work in promoting nutrition. We do have a list of these, um, or some of these, local organizations on the following slide. 
Um, if your school needs funding, remember Aussie has two grants that might um, pertain to this. The Farm to School grant and the School Garden grant might be of interest. And you can find more information on the links here or the Aussie website. And creating a t support team is also very important. Um, you don't want to feel like you're alone in this process. The more people you have on board, the better. So reach out to others like the school principal, the school nurse, teachers, parents, food service directors, basically anybody that's interested in promoting this can be a great and the more the merrier. So after you create your support team, you can work on different ways in which you can be role models and this is really important. Remember that you are a role model to these students and so what you're doing would really influence them since they look up to you. So you want to be sure that you're setting a good example. And to do so, you can get your support team and create some of these um, healthy activities like engaging in a healthy cook-off or a healthy eating challenge. Um, you can pick a food of the week where you can showcase a healthy food or a healthier eating pattern to your students. So for example, you could do a whole grain Wednesday and highlight grains or you can do a meatless Monday and, fight and highlight some healthier eating patterns. Um, switch out the office candy bowl for a fresh fruit bowl. Again, they're going to be looking at you, and if you're promoting candy, they might be more likely to eat candy. Um, so that fresh fruit bowl might be a really good idea. And just pretty much focus on finding any opportunity where you can model to your students, show them that you eat healthy, that you work out, demonstrate how excited and proud you are about this. And then lastly, make sure that you do have a comprehensive local wellness policy that includes the need to provide nutrition education through various opportunities. Um, and having a wellness committee allows for easier implementation of this policy and it allows for it to actually become a living document. We don't want it to just sit there. And so as mentioned, this is a list of some of the community-based organizations that are in the D.C. area and that focus around nutrition and nutrition education. You can go directly on their website. You'll be able to find out a lot more information regarding what they do, and you can explore possible partnerships with them. And then on the, this last page, we do have some additional resources, a lot of which were mentioned throughout the presentation, and we really encourage you to check these out. Some of you, you may already be familiar with, but I'm going to provide you a little bit of information about those that may be new. And so the first one is the Nutrition Curricula Review Guide. And this will be released during this school year, the 2016-17 school year. It was created by the Coordinated Health Education Team within the Healthy Schools and Wellness Programs Team. And basically it used the Health Education Analysis Tool, the HECAT mentioned earlier, um, and a minimum of three experts reviewed various nutrition curricula, and then the scores were all averaged, and the scores have been displayed in an easy to comprehend manner so that the user, which would be you in this case, can determine whether the curriculum is or not comprehensive. And so if it is not comprehensive, then this is just a really good indicator that the nutrition curriculum needs to be complemented with additional materials so that you're ensuring that the student is learning all the necessary concepts within that topic. Um, so this tool, as mentioned, will be, meant, will be published later this year on the Aussie's website. And if you see that you're using a curriculum that's maybe not there, um, do not worry. We will be continuing to review curricula. So please um, let us know if there is one that you use that is not included in this guide. You can refer to Team Nutrition and MyPlay for additional resources and tools on the topic. And you can learn more about hand washing and food safety through the links that we have included here. And then earlier, I also mentioned the whole school, whole child, whole community model, um, which was used when developing the DC health education standards. And this framework was created by the CDC as well. It is considered the ideal framework in addressing health and academic outcomes. And it's a model which really focuses on the child. It emphasizes a school-wide approach, but it also acknowledges that the school is part of the local community. So it really takes a look at everything that could impact the child's health and wellness and education. 
And in a very simple um, diagram, it depicts the comprehensive approach that it should be taking to promote a positive educational and wellness outcome in the child. And then the last link that we have here is the school health index. And this is a tool by the CDC. And it's online. Your school can actually use this tool for free to review where you stand and to see how you can improve the health and the safety policies and programs that are currently in place. So with that, we would like to take some time to answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, so to ask a question, please just type it on your computer. There should be a little section where you can type up questions. We will go ahead and read the question out loud so that all attendees can hear it, and then we will answer your question. So we just got a question, yes, these slides will be made available. Um, we have a lot of links on there that we would like you to explore, so we will certainly be making these available. We will send them out to all those that have registered. So we got another question, it's can you please repeat the organization that offers the reimbursement? Oh, so when we mentioned reimbursement earlier, um, that refers to the USDA school lunches and breakfasts, um, and they have to meet certain guidelines in order for the school to be reimbursed. The next question is, what are some next steps for getting nutrition education locally? Uh, I would say the next steps would be to go through the slide that we have on local organizations. Um, review through those, and if any of them appeal to you, by all means, reach out to them. Um, I think there were probably eight different local organizations listed on that slide, and they're all great for nutrition education. Um, you can also email us directly, and we can give you more information. Yeah, please feel free to email us directly. We're happy to share whatever information um, we have additionally, and also be on the lookout for additional resources from Aussie. Um, so there will be some additional webinars coming up, and they might be useful as far as uh, providing some nutrition education. And really maybe take a look at that last slide also with some ideas. So if you don't already have uh, a support team in your school, maybe see if you can get some others on board to come up with some of these activities. Um, take a look at the different events that take place throughout the year, like the, the national um, initiatives, and maybe get your school to buy into one of those activities. So I know that we had some listed for March. Um, October. Yeah, yeah. So, so definitely um, take a look at those and see if any of those might be feasible to uh, implement in your school. All right, we're sorting through some of the other questions right now. So are there any organizations you could recommend to partner with that have a greater focus on the whole family rather than just the child? And so one, actually two come to mind. Um, I know there's an organization that was listed on one of the slides that um, focuses on like parent classes as well and 
there is also common threads um, that focuses on parent classes. So in, in, in those opportunities, you'll be able to engage the parents with their child um, by using some of the programs that they're offering. Um, so those two come to mind. I believe one is, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the, the association right now, but I know that Common Threads does have some, some of the parent classes which might be of interest. And then City Blossoms is the other one that I believe has um, the parent teacher like cooking classes. So you might want to reach out to them and see what they can offer because yeah, definitely engaging the whole family is, is very important and it's key in this process. So UDC also has a program where their nutrition students um, will go out to schools and for health fairs or assemblies and um, they tend to take a whole family approach as well. So we have another question that asks if there's a grant to cover partnerships for nutrition education just like the garden grant does. Um, right now we don't have one in place but I mean nutrition education is definitely an area that Aussie wants to grow and so I'm not sure if there will be any kind of funding associated with it, but in the meantime, you know, we're happy to connect you with many of the organizations that are out there. Um, we're happy to help you in any which way, way we can. Um, as we mentioned, remember that there will be a, a survey that will be sent out after this, and so if there were particular areas that maybe were really interesting, but were mentioned just briefly, and you want to see a more detailed webinar on it, um, we're happy to to do that. So we're happy to hear those suggestions. And that doesn't necessarily cover, you know, the funding part of it, but it could it could help for you to implement something inside your school without that funding source. So the next question is regarding reimbursable, there was also mention of posters. How could we get posters to put in our cafeteria? Um, right now I don't think Aussie has any posters created, um, but I'm sure you could go to USDA's website um, or email me and I can find some resources to send you as well. Um, most likely you'd have to get them printed yourself, but I could certainly send the resources to you so you could do that. Uh, the next question, what involvement do the chefs, do the chefs move to schools? Are, are these one-time events or ongoing relationships? Um, it could be either one. So if you have a specific health fair coming up and you want, you know, a famous DC chef to come by and do a little demo, that might be a one-time event. Um, but if you continuously work with the program, I'm sure they could have thing, uh, more regular events where the chefs come out to the schools. Um, it, it's an option for either one. Um, in addition to the sending out the slides, we will also have a recording of the webinar, which I know has been a recurring question. Um, there is a comment slash question here that says there were some great tools meant where Aussie site can uh, where on Aussie site can we find them? Um, so all of the tools mentioned were uh, hyperlinked in this PowerPoint. So when we send out the actual slides, you can go directly to these tools directly from the PowerPoint. Most of them are also on Aussie's website. Um, some of them can be found on the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable page, and then others can be found on the Health and Wellness page. And I know there was another one on dietitians and whether we have a list of local dietitians that work with schools. And uh, so if you go to eatright.org, at the very top of the page there's a tab that says find a dietitian. Uh, if you go to that page and click on that, it'll take you to a page where you type in a zip code and um, or you could look throughout the whole district. Um, and then it'll help put you in contact with the dietitians. You'll even see what their specialties are, so you could specifically select community-based dietitians 
um, rather than clinical dietitians to see if they'll be interested to come out to your school. Yeah, and so eatright.org is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics website, and so it's not an actual website from Aussie, but it's a good resource if you are looking for dietitians. Um, and yeah, like Andrea mentioned, you're more than welcome to, to see which ones of them either already work in school of nutrition or maybe are willing to go to your school and you know talk at any point. Dietetic interns are also great. Um, a lot of them need to fill a requirement for a certain number of hours spent in community or school nutrition. Uh, so if you ever get reached out to by a dietitian, um, that's also great to consider. And so another question we got is, what local programs provide dietetic interns? And so some of the dietetic programs in the area include the University of Maryland, um, Virginia Tech, um, the National Institutes of Health, so NIH has an internship in the area, Howard University, Hopkins has interns, yeah, Johnson. Usually if you go to the school's dietetic internship website, there'll be a contact that you could reach out to. They're always looking for places to send their interns. Um, so I guarantee if you reach out to them, you'll most likely get an intern because they're always looking for different rotations to send students to. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Okay, so thank you all for the really great questions. All right, and um, we'll be sending out an email shortly with the PowerPoint slides and, yeah, maybe within the next few weeks with the slides and a post-webinar survey. Um, be sure to complete this survey that we send out uh, in order to receive the professional development credits. Um, after you submit the survey, we'll send out a certificate that you'll keep for your records. Um, and then you'll be able to claim the credits. And then if you have any other questions, um, our contact information will be on the second slide. Yeah, so I'm going to go back to that contact information in case anybody's interested in um, getting that really quickly since we won't be sending out the webinar right away. Um, All right, and we'll give you a second to write our information down. And so again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, please be on the lookout for that email with all the follow-up information to the webinar. And we are so glad that you were able to join us today. Thank you very much.